Jackson heard the familiar voice of his wife's friend, Becky or Bex, as her friends called her, and immediately dismissed the thought. It was Saturday afternoon, and Jackson returned home earlier than expected after playing golf. Curious, he looked out through the sliding patio door and saw his wife and three of her friends leisurely warming themselves by the pool, sipping a mimosa cocktail. Diana, his wife, was lying on a chaise long with her back to the door, and Bex took the seat to her right. Red-haired Steph sat right in front of Dee, and Cheryl leaned back on a towel to her left by the pool. He deliberately kept his distance in order to remain unnoticed and at the same time be able to listen carefully. I'm sorry, Bex, but my mind is preoccupied with a single thought. I can't help but think about how it will feel. His wife replied, addressing the topic that everyone was discussing. Moreover, I will be careful that Jackson doesn't find out anything. I refuse to follow in Candace's footsteps. In their company, Candace is considered the most promiscuous. She shares stories of seduction and unforgettable intimate encounters with her friends. Somehow, they always reveal the truth. My experience with Candace was an absolute disaster, and I deeply regret the stupid decisions I made because of her. She turned out to be my undoing, and now she can become yours. Bex replied with a touch of sadness, and then he heard what his wife was saying. It's extremely important for me to find out if size really matters, as Candace claims, but only once, and no more. If you're wondering, that's just not true, Cheryl chimed in. Cheryl, like Jackson and Diana, has been married for almost as long. When I was a student, I had a romantic relationship with one man, but over time the passion faded, and I realized that he was just another person who was only interested in physical intimacy. But everything changed when I met Bert. He showed a unique ability to love me with the greatest honor and respect. A person with great dignity exists only because of his unwavering commitment to it. In fact, he is devoid of any intrigue. She took a sip casually. It's just a physical pleasure, nothing more. It's frustrating, really. Steph, who never tied the knot, intervened in the conversation. Recalling that when she decided to join their bachelorette party, she warned herself against becoming emotionally attached to any partner she danced with. Although her intentions were pure, many men visit clubs with the sole purpose of having an intimate relationship. The complexity of the situation lies in the fact that she unintentionally entered into a romantic relationship with this man. Whether she realizes it or not, they're dating now. Candace, like me doesn't experience amazing intimate encounters every night and often feels lonely at home. I am aware of this, and it seems that you are following the same path. Personally, I would give anything to have a man like Jackson in my life. He's kind, friendly with everyone, successful in business, and a wonderful father. Standing up, Candace wrapped a towel around her waist. Although it's your choice, I want to make it clear to you that if Jackson ever rejects you, I will do everything in my power to make him mine. Dee looked at her friend. I need you to understand the gravity of the situation. I have no choice but to do this, Bex pleaded, their sadness obvious. But this will not be an isolated case. This does not happen. I know this because I have already experienced this, Candace added. As Jackson listened to their conversation, he was overcome with anger. His wife, with whom he had lived for more than two decades, was on the verge of having an intimate relationship with a stranger she met at a club. It's all a lie, he thought to himself. Filled with rage, he impulsively pushed the screen aside, causing it to fall off the railing. Dee hurried to the pool, her heart pounding with impatience. Suddenly, a strong grip grabbed her left arm and yanked her up. Startled, she turned and met her husband's gaze. His rage was palpable and visible even to other women. His right hand swiftly grabbed the wedding and engagement rings, forcibly removing them from her left hand. Tears welled up in Dee's eyes, and she begged, My rings! But the husband coldly declared, You're not my wife anymore, so go and enjoy today. Overcome with anger, he threw the precious symbols of their union onto the roof. 
and they fell into the street in front of their house and rushed to the pool. Dee felt a hand grab her left arm and pull her up. She turned to face her husband. The fury in his eyes was visible to all the women. His right hand grabbed the wedding and engagement rings, and he pulled them off her left hand. My rings, she screamed. Well, you're not my wife anymore, so you can go have fun today. In anger, he threw the rings through the roof onto the street in front of their house. Have intimate pleasures with your boyfriend while maintaining your self-respect. He was trembling with rage and indignation. I overheard every word. I knew you weren't the best at bachelorette parties, but I never thought you'd get involved with a stranger from a bar. Dee collapsed onto the sidewalk, visibly upset. Steph got up first and tried to comfort Jackson. Calm down, Jackson. She really didn't commit any wrongdoing. Nonsense, he replied. Fuck you all. When you first started bringing her to parties, each of you knew the consequences, especially you, Steph. He pointed a finger in her direction. Since you're all here, help this slutty woman pack her things and take them out of my house. Cheryl, with the smile she usually used to manipulate her husband, intervened. Come on, you're probably joking, she said softly, putting her hand on his chest. Suddenly, she lost her balance and tumbled into the pool. After pushing Cheryl into the pool, he left. I won't be home for an hour, and when I get back, I don't want to see her in my house anymore. Besides, I've heard everything Bex has said and I'm looking forward to our upcoming dates. However, I want you to know that I will not enter into any intimate relationship until my divorce is finalized. These people who used to be your friends will no longer communicate with you. Don't you think that's acceptable? Beck stood up confidently and replied, No, not at all. Unable to hide her smile, he was an unexpected discovery for her. She firmly believed that she had learned wisdom from her previous mistakes. A week later, Dee's wish came true. At the bachelorette party on Friday, Beck saw Dee warmly greeting her boyfriend. Bex recognized him. He belonged to that disgusting group of men who frequented clubs to take advantage of married women. She remembered him as a former roommate of a man who had once seduced her, which she would forever regret. Tonight, she foresaw a profound change in Dee's life, similar to the one she had experienced herself. Despite feeling guilty for not intervening, she couldn't ignore the fact that Dee's decisions were decisive, a trait she noticed back in elementary school. She wished she had captured the evidence of this seduction earlier as she had during their recent bachelorette parties. She discreetly took pictures on her phone, hoping to remind her friend of the consequences and prevent her from repeating her past mistakes. These pictures served as a visual reminder of the image that Dee projected to the whole world, a married woman betraying her husband. It seems that she took these photos with the intention of seducing Dee's husband and making him her own. At least that's what she thought. Dee decided not to dance with her boyfriend tonight. Instead, she looked at her friends and informed them that she would catch up with them later. With that, she walked up to the man and exchanged greetings with him before they left the club together. In his modest and disheveled apartment, Dee felt nervous and agitated. It's been 21 years since she's been with anyone but Jackson. Take off my clothes, she said. As she reached for his zipper, her companion's gaze fell on her free finger, devoid of a wedding ring. Put on the rings, he asked. I want to see them on your hand when you touch me. Dee replied with regret. I can't. Jackson took them when he kicked me out of the house last weekend. Her interlocutor, perplexed, asked about Jackson's motives, wondering if she was unfaithful. Defending herself, she quickly denied the accusation, explaining... No, he overheard my conversation with my friends about how I crave intimacy with you. It was this revelation that made him snatch the rings from me and kick me out. She noticed a sudden change in his interest in her, realizing that maybe Bex was right in her assessment. This man wanted her only because she was married, guided solely by her hobby. Don't you want intimacy with me? What is it? She asked, not taking her gaze off him. Although she possessed undeniable attractiveness, it was clear that without her husband she was not attracted to him. 
He saw her only as an object, not really interested in her as a person. Who needs an unfaithful wife? He mused. If it is so easy to gain her favor, then who can't do the same? A thought occurred to him. She is a spoiled commodity. Although there is something else that should be taken into account. I will fulfill your wishes tonight. It's obvious that you yearn for intimacy, and I understand you. But after we get intimate, you have to leave. I'm not interested in you lingering around trying to take on the role of my girlfriend because I'm not your boyfriend. My goal is to charm married women, because I'm not looking for affection. As he said these words, a mischievous grin appeared on his face. Taking off his trousers, he carelessly threw them on the sofa, and then unbuttoned his shirt. He might not have the same physical shape as Jackson, but it didn't matter to her. She was determined in her desires. After a moment, he abruptly pushed her away and directed her to his bed. Without thinking, he forcefully pushed her onto the disheveled mattress. As I expected, you liked it. He grinned and disappeared into the bathroom, closing the door behind him. Despite the undeniable significance of this meeting, a wave of sadness and disappointment washed over her. But this meeting brought back memories of her first experience, which left her completely disappointed. Returning to Steph's apartment, she couldn't help but notice that it had only been an hour since she had left the club with him. The thought flashed through her mind that she might end up in Jackson's arms after an intimate encounter. And yet, overwhelmed with sadness and loneliness, with tears on her cheeks, Dee decided to take an Uber back to Steph's abandoned apartment. Jackson devoted an entire week to meticulously preparing for the start of a new chapter in his life. Although some might call him introverted, he found solace in sharing his problems by locking them in small boxes. His thriving business allowed him to delegate tasks, giving him the opportunity to focus on matters that required his immediate attention. Jackson expected Dee to be officially hired on Monday. It is important to note that his intentions were not dictated by revenge or ill will in their upcoming settlement. After all, they had lived together for more than two decades, and Du had proven herself to be an exemplary wife and devoted mother to their son. She had finally reached the point where she felt worthy of weekly get-togethers with her friends. Since the pool was installed, the girls gathered around it every weekend, relaxing and relaxing. Although he didn't mind their presence too much, there were times when he got tired of their constant presence. On the other hand, Diana was going on a new adventure, and Jackson made a two-hour trip to have dinner with their son on his college campus. Jackson intended to discuss the divorce with his son, wanting to approach the issue as man-to-man, -man, as his own father had done. He came to the conclusion that his father's actions allowed him to avoid possible problems and give his mother the opportunity to achieve her own happiness. But he knew that his mother held the opposite view. The next day, Saturday, Jackson returned home with his son, hoping that this visit would not negatively affect the boy's academic performance this semester. After dinner, Steph asked how Diana had spent the evening with her lover and asked if he had met her expectations. Diana expressed her disappointment, admitting that Candace's provocative stories had exceeded her expectations. Steph, a single woman with a busy life, expected to have the most incredible, intimate experience. But her expectations were shattered, and she was completely disappointed. Convinced that she needed the perfect partner, Steph believed she had found it in two different men she was dating. Surprisingly, both people knew about each other's presence in Steph's life, and she was sure that she would be able to captivate them for a night of wild fun. After enjoying a delicious dinner and dancing on the dance floor, both couples eventually returned to Steph's apartment. It was obvious that Steph had made a decision between two men, and the second man, whom she had not chosen, was more than willing to agree with this. They relaxed together on the couch, kissing passionately and enjoying each other's touch. When the situation escalated to the limit, he boldly pushed her away, despite Diana's objections. She was soon overcome with disappointment. She wondered if this was going to be her future, 
a cycle of unsatisfactory encounters with men who seemed to be focused solely on their own pleasure, ignoring hers. She managed to free herself from his grip, and she quickly headed to the bathroom, seeking solace in the soothing stream of water. The desire to clean herself up overwhelmed her, as she could not get rid of the feeling of dirt. Two nights in a row brought her disappointment in the form of unsatisfactory meetings with different men. As the warm water cascaded over her body, she was overcome by a sense of comfort that momentarily calmed her restless mind. Lost in the gentle touches of water on her skin, she felt the unexpected presence of a cool breeze in her soul. Startled, she turned around and found that someone had joined her. Their annoying hands quickly grabbed her from behind, and this unwanted intrusion disturbed the peace she had been waiting for. With a mixture of alarm and defiance, she gathered her strength to respond. Hey, stop it, she protested. I value my privacy and personal boundaries. Please respect that. The intrusion and the casual remark about intimacy in the shower made her even more upset, highlighting the stark contrast between her desire for a genuine connection and the superficial encounters she had recently experienced. When he forcefully pulled her closer, she barely resisted because of his height advantage. Desperately looking for a way to fight him off, she frantically searched behind the shower curtain for some object that could help her. During these searches, her fingers came across a soap dish lying on the edge of the window seal. Without thinking, she grabbed it with her left hand and brought it down hard on his head. The soap dish shattered into countless pieces, and he collapsed, stunned, on the floor in the shower. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Diana quickly climbed over his fallen figure and settled on the toilet seat, making shrill screams calling Steph for help. While Diana sat anxiously on the toilet seat, hoping for salvation, Jackson was blissfully dozing on the couch. Ever since he cut Dee out of their lives, he's made the couch his place to sleep. Despite the fact that he had their bed at his disposal, the thought of Dee sharing intimate moments with others in this very space did not allow him to seek solace there. Awakened by an insistent knock on the front door, he reluctantly got up, dressed only in boxers and a t-shirt, and cautiously approached the entrance. If he had looked through the peephole, he probably would have refrained from opening the door to the mysterious visitor. But alas, he opened the door, revealing the very embodiment of depravity. Candace was an attractive woman with a petite figure and an attractive cheerleader physique. Like Jackson, she was a successful business owner, running a fitness center franchise where she personally taught classes and trained people suffering from weight problems. But despite her physical beauty, Jackson always saw her as a liar. To him, it looked like a flawless-looking apple, but when bitten, a rotten core was revealed. It was well past midnight when Jackson noticed her presence, dressed in an elegant black outfit that made him frown disapprovingly. What do you want? Her seductive smile, which never failed, graced her face. I thought maybe you needed some satisfying intimacy, and I'd be happy to help you. Her fingers brushed lightly over his face and down his chest. You're doing great, Jax. It's going to be an incredible experience. Jackson, as if nothing had happened, quickly removed her hand. Go back to your room. That's not going to happen. She was almost childish. Please think again. I heard the news that D and you have ended the relationship, and I have to say that it will be very entertaining, she said. Jackson gently pushed Candace away from the entrance and quickly closed the door in her face. A satisfied grin appeared on Candace's lips, and she headed back to her car. There was something exciting about a man playing with difficulties. On Sunday morning, Jackson did something he hadn't done in two decades. He decided to clean up and attend a church service. Raised in the Baptist faith, he wasn't sure he wanted to listen to a sermon filled with fire and brimstone. Fortunately, there was a non-denominational church within walking distance of the house. Arriving a few minutes before the start of the service, Jackson chose a seat a few rows back. In order not to inconvenience the parishioners, he deliberately chose a place in the middle of the row so that no one would have to climb over him to take a seat. The sermon was dedicated to how to become a better version of yourself with the help of God.
which will allow you to help others. Jackson was deeply moved and often felt inadequate in terms of his contribution to other people's lives. Despite his success, he lacked the motivation to help others. Perhaps, he reflected, he should become a mentor to young people and guide them to success. The example he sets can be the key to success. This thought gave him great satisfaction until he got home and saw Diana sitting on the stairs. Suddenly, she jumped up and started shouting at him fiercely. Where have you been? She asked, upset. I called and came to find you, but my keys don't work and the garage access code doesn't work either. He replied calmly. If you're really interested, I went to church. Perhaps instead of engaging in promiscuous behavior, you should seek solace in the church. I'm sure there are decent men there with whom you can find a common language. When he unlocked the door, she followed him inside. Dee wasted no time in expressing her desire to return home, stressing that she could not continue to live with Steph because of her unproductive lifestyle. Don't even think about it. No, you can't live here. I've released you from an oath that you were going to break anyway if you haven't already. By the way, what kind of sexual relationship was it that you just had to do? I don't... Dee didn't finish. She wanted to say that I didn't like it. But Jackson finished for her. Don't lie. I've known you too long and I can tell you've been through this since you left here. There is no turning back. You know how I felt. Dee recalled the past year. Namely the moment when she expressed a desire to attend a bachelorette party with her friends. His reaction was harsh and direct. He stated that such an event would inevitably lead to infidelity in their marriage. It didn't matter if it happened on the first or the hundredth night. He firmly believed that sooner or later it would happen. Deep down, she didn't want to admit that he might be right. He argued that married women should not behave as if they were not married as this would only cause trouble. In addition, he was worried about the possible consequences for his business, fearing that clients might find out about her actions and move their business elsewhere because of her alleged misconduct. Dee tried to hug him, but was stopped by his resistance. Tomorrow I will contact Tracy, my new assistant, and ask her to help me make a list of affordable and safe apartments for you, he announced. After preparing the list, she will send it to your work email, and you can choose the desired bedroom furniture and everything else that you may need. Dee pleaded with tears in her eyes. I can't support myself on my current income. I'm begging you to help me. Jackson remained steadfast in his opinion. You've never needed a job, he claimed. I earn a significant amount of money, but you insisted on working. Despite this, you don't save anything and spend your entire salary quickly. You can't keep living like this anymore. As a divorced woman, you have to take responsibility for your finances. Besides, there are many families who live on lower incomes than you do. He walked her to her car before she left. If you prefer discreet delivery, you can visit Abe's office on Tuesday to get the legal documents. Otherwise, they will be served at your workplace on Wednesday. D reluctantly accepted the documents at work on Wednesday, secretly hoping that Jackson would change his mind about divorcing her. Having lived together for more than two decades, she always got her way. She suddenly realized that the Jackson who once adored her was not the Jackson who decided to hide his love. On Wednesday evening, the smell of alcohol was thick in Cheryl's house. Trying to cheer up Dee, the girls got together and indulged in excessive drinking without eating. Candace appeared in the fog with a bottle of wine and a bottle of Jack Daniels. In her perplexity, she could not understand the nature of this gathering. As the night went on and the inhibitions disappeared, the conversations became more open and the confessions poured out. Candace enthusiastically announced her intention to seduce Jackson, which caused her slightly intoxicated friends to laugh. Cheryl joined them, jokingly reminding Candace that Bex was the first to show interest in him. Candace confidently stood up, ran her hands over her toned body, and ridiculed the idea that Bex's mom's body could compete with hers. At the same time, Candace admitted that her attempt to seduce Jackson was unsuccessful as he rejected her advances. Dee asked her friend's thoughts and asked what she was thinking. In response, she said that she dreams of marrying Jackson, 
never working again, enjoying intimacy with him and living comfortably. With a smirk on her face, she considered the idea of marrying him, but eventually, after living together for a while, she broke up. Deep down, she acknowledged her inability to be faithful. It was at this moment that Diana began to realize the consequences of her actions. Meanwhile, Dee began to drink even more, seeking solace in alcohol. When Jackson opened the front door, a surprise awaited him. Bex and the children were standing on the threshold with a casserole dish in her hands. I thought you could use a friend tonight, she said warmly. The group gathered on the terrace to share a meal together, and when the food was eaten, the evening continued. Bex and Jackson had a heartfelt conversation about his emotions about the events that unfolded after he asked Dee to leave. In the background, children were busy playing basketball in the backyard. It is worth noting that the rest of the girls are now with Dee to support her during this difficult time, and I want to be with you. I'm grateful for your friendship. Although her stay was short-lived, Bex kissed Jackson gently on the lips before saying goodbye. A smile graced Jackson's face as their lips parted gently. Jackson was suddenly woken up between 1.30 a.m. and 2 a.m. by Diana's drunken phone call. In a state of intoxication, she tossed between tears and swearing, asking how he could betray her like that and whether his love for her was not enough. But Jackson looked at it differently, believing that it was Dee who did not put their love at the forefront by participating in questionable activities in clubs. Tired of the altercation, he decided to end the conversation by disconnecting the call after the third ring. Jackson waited until 11 p.m. to call, knowing full well that she was intoxicated. But he did not receive any apologies for the fact that she had been calling incessantly the previous day. He asked her why she hadn't answered Tracy's call about the apartment she'd found for Diana. Ignoring his question, she said she wanted to go home. No, he said firmly. I know about your infidelity with other men, which made our marriage irreparable. You couldn't even hold back until our breakup became official. I hope you got everything you wanted from your actions. When he heard a knock on the door, he looked up and saw Bex with a paper bag in her hands. He motioned for her to wait a little while he finished the phone call. Exhaling deeply, he turned to Diana. You have expressed a desire to date other men, so I offer you the opportunity to live the life of a single divorced woman, as you clearly wish. Please sign the papers. If you don't meet with Tracy tomorrow, I'll personally handle the apartment issue on your behalf. I'll pay for the first two months of the lease, that's all. It's time for me to leave. Bex pleasantly surprised me with lunch, bringing a smile to my face. When our conversation came to an end, he disconnected the call. By six o'clock, Stephanie was tired of Dee's incessant conversations. Girl, it's time to let him go, she advised, her voice full of concern. Bex is not stealing your man. Deep down, you know it's true. Remember, it was you who pursued him and won him over. But what did Jackson get out of all this? He realized that he could not satisfy his wife's desires after more than 20 years of marriage. I don't want to upset you, sister but no man would willingly choose this option. The Jackson I know won't take you back. D resisted, refusing to accept the truth. The words sounded hollow because she still didn't want to listen. Steph gave her a puzzled look. You didn't even try to interfere. It's typical for you to achieve what you want without hesitation. This behavior has always been a part of your being. Besides, I am well aware of my promiscuity and accept it. You made a mistake and now you want Jackson to ignore it. Consider yourself lucky that he doesn't know about your other misdeeds. Maybe dressing up in something provocative will cheer you up. Two weeks have passed, and I have experienced many unsuccessful meetings with newfound partners. Bert and Cheryl, along with Dee, looked around the apartment that Jackson had rented for her. To create a sense of home, Jackson thoughtfully furnished the room with furniture from their master bedroom, and all of Dee's favorite things. Not only was everything freshly painted and immaculately cleaned, but even the refrigerator was prudently filled. Understanding Cheryl's request, Bert took on the role of a caring husband and carefully brought Dee's clothes into the house. He took the time to hang up everything he needed, 
and took out neatly folded clothes from plastic containers. In the end, Bert took a short break to return with a delicious meal. Cheryl and Dee spent the evening together, as Cheryl wanted to dispel Dee's feeling of loneliness on her first night in the apartment. Not knowing Dee, Cheryl knew about her friend's intention to delay the divorce in the hope that her husband would realize his love for her and reconcile, returning her to the idyllic life that she once had. Cheryl kept the information that Bex often dined with Jackson during the week a secret, as she knew that this would only worsen Dee's emotional state. To improve the situation, Cheryl suggested the idea of having a bachelorette party to celebrate Dee's move to a new home. On Friday, Bex answered Cheryl's call. It was her sister, excitedly extending her hand. Hello, little sister. We're going to Dee's new apartment this Friday. You have to come. We haven't seen each other in ages, Cheryl pleaded. After a pause, she added, You know, the father of the children hasn't been able to pick them up lately. He works out of town and I'm sitting at home, unable to go outside. Cheryl did visit Jackson, but only for a short hour. I was just checking on him, she admitted. She was sure that he would not overstep the boundaries and enter into an intimate relationship with her. I'll try to find someone who can be with them on Friday. After all, they are teenagers, and it may happen that they will be left alone. Of course, it won't happen soon, but in the end, I will have to take care of the safety of my deposit. They tend to quarrel and cause chaos in the house. Jackson was looking forward to sharing a meal with Bex. She knew that, judging by their friendship, he rarely left the office for lunch. He was very scrupulous about bringing lunch from home. Perhaps this is the reason for his success, his attention to small details. It's amazing how something as simple as working just two blocks from Jackson brought them closer together. Although it didn't happen often, he genuinely enjoyed her company. Among his friends, Diana was the only one he really liked, although he tolerated the rest for the sake of maintaining harmony. During their lunch together on Thursday, Bex made a request to him. She asked if he could look after her children so she could attend Dee's housewarming party. Without hesitation, he answered with an unequivocal, yes. Jackson found great pleasure in spending time with her children. For three boys aged 13, 15, and 16, Jackson was like an uncle. They admired him and saw him as a cool uncle who played basketball with them when they came to visit. Jackson really missed playing basketball with his own son, but these boys helped him fill that void. Bex didn't have to worry about taking the kids, because Jackson showed up and drove them to baseball fields and go-karting races. Standing outside the door, Bex paused for a moment and took a deep breath before knocking. A voice came from inside. Come in. Peeking through the door, she saw Cheryl and Steph with their wine glasses held high. But before she could step into the room, Candace abruptly pushed past her. Hey, ladies! Candace barked, clearly feeling the gravity of the situation. A moment later, there was the sound of a toilet flushing, and Dee appeared from the bathroom. There was an unspoken tension in the room between Bex and Dee, although it was clear that it would not be silent all evening. As wine and whiskey flowed like a river, the prohibitions began to weaken. In a drunken state, Cheryl became convinced that they should all help Dee reunite with Jax. Bex felt a deep pain inside, realizing that she really loved Jackson, not Jax. At the moment of intoxication, Candace confessed to the group that Dee believes that she can only bring Jackson back by sleeping with him. Candace talked about how pleasant it is for her to touch him, emphasizing that his size is just right for a satisfying, intimate relationship. Bex chastised Candace for her rude remarks, but Candace responded in a mocking tone, hinting that Bex had her own intentions towards Jackson. Candace asked if Bex believed she had what it took to win him over. A mother is looking for a father figure for her children, and the person in question currently has no dependents. The question arises, why should this person take on the role of educator of children? She knew perfectly well that her friends had superficial inclinations, as her former partner often reminded her. But when Candace started discussing her relationship with Jackson in a similar way, 
it crossed all boundaries. Before getting into an argument with Candace, Dee pushed her hair aside and exclaimed passionately, urging her to stay away from her husband. She made it clear that he belonged to her and demanded that Candace keep her distance. Dee has repeatedly noticed Candace leaving the office during her lunch break. Dee forcefully pushed Bex towards the door, prompting her to finally tell her friends her innermost thoughts. As soon as the door swung open, Bex's words poured out, filled with cold. At that moment she realized the gravity of the situation, but Dee firmly stated that this man no longer belongs to Bex. Dee noted that Bex recklessly abandoned him in favor of other men. In Dee's opinion, this person does not deserve such treatment. This was followed by a painful reminder that Dee was aware of Bex's many antics, especially those she committed during the bachelorette parties. Steph intervened, claiming that Bex had indeed researched a lot of men since moving in with her. Cheryl's voice added to the tense atmosphere. Do you think that having a boyfriend is always possible just because Bert knows that his wife is taller than him? While this may be true, it is important to understand that cheating will never be acceptable. Unfortunately, I learned this lesson from personal experience. It looks like you decided not to have children because you want to keep your figure but you'll never understand what the honor and joy of being a mother is. Steph seems to have a shallow nature, which may prevent her from ever finding a lasting marriage. It's pretty obvious that no man really needs a woman like you. Although you can receive invitations to dates, hoping for constant communication, it seems that you are not needed for anything more. And as for Candace, if every man you slept with was as noticeable as the needles sticking out of your body, You'd look like a porcupine. After a moment's silence, she added, I'm not stalking Jackson. I'm just giving him the space he needs. But now the truth is out. I will haunt your husband, D. Keep in mind that when he becomes mine, he will never think of any of you again. I realized from my past that it is very difficult to find a good husband. When she said these words, he will never regret being with me, I guarantee it, and she abruptly ran out, slamming the door behind her. Bex returned to her empty apartment and sank down on the couch, plunged into solitude for an eternity. Since her boys were under Jackson's care, she felt anxious at the thought of being left alone. Overcoming her emotions, she took out her phone and dialed Jackson's number. He reassured her and asked her to come, as their turn at the baseball practice booth was scheduled in just 30 minutes. To diffuse the tense atmosphere, he jokingly complained that his ass hurt after a previous go-karting session. Upon arriving at the scene, Bex found Jackson and her children, who were enthralled by the baseball booth on the field. She sat on a bench behind the fence and watched him work with his three sons. While the older boys were independent and did not need his guidance, the younger one sought his help. A smile graced her face as she watched the precious moments they shared. Jackson, noticing her gaze, shone even brighter. Gesturing for her to join them, he handed her a baseball helmet, silently inviting her to participate in the game. Although she initially refused, the children persistently urged her to participate. And now she is already standing with a bat on her shoulder, hitting a pitch, but unfortunately, does not hit. Jackson slipped behind her and carefully took the bat off her shoulder. Ordering her to bend her knees, he suggested how to serve the next ball. To her amazement, she hit the ball. Not quite well, but not quite missed either. The unexpected victory filled her with a sense of confidence. Jackson's presence held her tightly against her back, helping her prepare for the blow. Her heartbeat quickened, and a wave of delight swept through her veins. She hadn't felt such joy in a hundred years. Laughter bubbled up in the depths of her soul until tears flowed down her face. This evening will always remain in her memory. When she realized her love for Jackson, a smile lit up his face. He was driving behind Bex's car in the direction of her apartment. Even though she insisted that he didn't need to follow them home, he just smiled. When he reached his destination, he kindly helped to pack the boys and their belongings, after which he offered to have breakfast together the next morning. Nodding in agreement, she accepted the invitation. 
On their way back, a message from Bert appeared on his phone. At this time, the girls left Dee's apartment, heading to the club. They stopped on the road that led them to the drunk tank. Bert was informed that the outcome of the case depended on him, but he decided that they needed a valuable lesson and refrained from interfering. Obviously, drunk driving has increased their insurance rates. He wondered if Diana had been driving. During breakfast, Jackson and Bex further strengthened their relationship. Bex talked about the events of the previous evening at D's and the words she had said. Jackson thought it was funny that she opposed them. Curiosity consumed him as he pondered the reasons for her premature departure, secretly wishing it had been done for his own good. Although he was aware that there was selfishness in his desire, he believed that deep down everyone craves such selflessness. Honesty became his aspiration, and he finally plucked up the courage to express his frank emotions to her. I have to confess something, he began, his voice brimming with sincerity. Last night when I hugged you in the walls of the baseball cage, I felt absolutely right, and I have a suspicion that you might feel the same way. She nodded in agreement, and their eyes met in a sign of mutual understanding. At that moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of security and protection, she admitted, and her cheeks flushed with an embarrassed blush. To be completely honest, I fell in love with you many years ago. Despite what I know about your marital status, I'm willing to wait as long as it takes. She rummaged in her purse and took out an envelope. Deep down, I know that I have a secret, and you are well aware of its details. The day you cut D out of your life, I made a solemn vow to do everything I could to be by your side. Realizing how important it is to demonstrate my sincerity, the following Monday, I immediately passed a test for sexually transmitted diseases. Rest assured, the results have confirmed that I am free of any infections. To be honest, it's been over a year since I last experienced intimacy with a man. Her openness amazed him, and he praised her for it. Becky, I admit that you've made mistakes, he said. I was there in the days leading up to your divorce and I saw how sorry you felt. Despite that, I always knew you were a good person. But I couldn't understand why you kept going on night dates, knowing that it would eventually lead to a divorce. She looked down. You may not understand this right now, and I sincerely hope you never have to do this. But when you're divorced and have kids, dating becomes an incredibly difficult prospect. Even if you realize that you may not be the perfect couple, you still long to feel loved. Every woman wants to be desired by a man, and I had the same desire. It's so simple. She raised her head. But I've learned some valuable lessons. After all, being a devoted mother is more important than seeking physical intimacy. I thought that if I improved myself, I could attract a more suitable partner. Why did you let Diana go on sleepover dates with you? She reached across the table and took his hand. I tried to dissuade her, but deep down I knew that if she decided on something, it was inevitable. And although it was never my intention to get involved with men, I understood that it was my duty to be with her and protect her from the same mistakes that I had made. A smile appeared on his face. It looks like you were having a hard time doing this job. As they continued to hold hands at the table, he openly expressed his feelings to her. I truly believe that there is a deep connection between us. That day we spent on the terrace, I want you to know that when I said I was going to date you, I really meant it. Among all her friends, you have always stood out as the best, and I sincerely enjoy our conversations. Our lunches and phone calls have become something I'm looking forward to. You have an incredible ability to call me ridiculous and laugh heartily at the same time. Besides, you are an exceptional mother. Bex confessed her thoughts with a worried expression on her face. And since we're being honest, I have to admit that I feel the same way. But when I look at myself from the outside, I can't help but notice that I'm not like the others. I don't go to the gym and unfortunately I often face condemnation because of my mother's body. I am experiencing financial difficulties, and with my current income, it is difficult to provide enough food for my three teenage boys. 
Even the alimony I receive does not cover their nutritional needs. He gently took her hands, comforting her. You have an amazing appearance. Your beauty and curves are simply mesmerizing. He grinned mischievously. I'm looking forward to seeing those curves. The waitress came over with their bill, smiling at his remark. When they stood up, he picked up the check from the table, looked at her, and smiled. Bex leaned into him, pressing her whole body against his, and kissed him gently on the lips. It's been a while since she's done anything like this. More than a year has passed since the last intimate meeting. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, Jackson was standing in his underpants and looking at himself in the mirror. He was going to have an intimate relationship with a woman who was not his future ex-wife, which he had not done for 25 years. Ever since he found out about Dee's infidelity, he has been plagued by a sense of self-doubt. Bex struck him as an attractive and alluring woman, evoking emotions he hadn't felt in a long time. With anticipation, he inhaled sharply and turned the door handle. He could already imagine her presence, sitting patiently on the bed and waiting for his arrival. But his surprise increased when he found her under the sheets, wrapped up to her chin. Jackson felt disappointed. He was eager to move her to another place and expressed his desire when he carefully removed the covers and settled on Bex's bed. You can open me up later when I feel at ease, she said softly, putting off his request. I am new to this business, and I hope that my appearance will not let you down. Jackson hugged her, feeling the touch of her bare skin against his. Your body will never let me down, no matter how my ex looks. She needs her looks, not me, because I've always found curvy women attractive. At that moment, he leaned closer and their lips met. Their tender acquaintance turned into a fiery flame. Dazed and tired, she sank onto his chest, her breathing becoming ragged. It had been an eternity since she had experienced something so intimate, unlike anything she had ever encountered before. Memories of her ex haunted her, but this was a completely different area. After the divorce, most of the men she dated didn't put her satisfaction first. These people, including her former partner, sought only their own pleasure from intimate life, regardless of her needs. Knowing about this common desire among men, she did not find any pleasure in it. But when Jackson hugged her tightly and held her close, she felt a deep sense of satisfaction. This moment has forever occupied a special place in his heart making him feel confident and full-fledged man again. Although he couldn't fully comprehend the impact she had on him, he understood that she had undoubtedly influenced him in some profound way. When they both fell asleep, he clung to her tightly, unwilling to let go. Jackson woke up first, and his gaze was full of tenderness as he watched her. In his imagination, she underwent a metamorphosis. Bex, known as Diana's friend, was a bright and cheerful person. Rebecca appeared to him from the other side, mature and deep, to whom he could feel strong feelings. He not only treasured the minutes he spent with her, but also found great joy in communicating with her sons. Little did he know that the desire to become a father was quietly growing in him. He kissed her gently, waking her from her slumber. I do not know where this path will lead us, but I want only you and no other women in my life. I understand that you may not feel the same way, but I would be very pleased if you felt that way. When she kissed him, he couldn't have asked for anything better. A smile graced Rebecca's face until she saw the alarm clock. Oh no, it's been over an hour. The guys will be worried. Getting out of bed, Jackson took his first look at her body and was delighted. Despite the fact that she considered herself obese, he found her flawless. Can I use your shower? Naturally, he considered joining her in the shower, but admitted that at that moment her role as a mother was more important. He refrained from interfering while she was getting dressed, but instead walked her to her car and said goodbye to her with a loving kiss. Could you bring the boys in a couple of hours? He asked worried about how they would take it that he was dating their mother. In response, she smiled warmly and affectionately. Later, when Rebecca returned with her sons, 
she found that Jackson was busy grilling, cooking burgers as well as potato salad. Beans and sauce were scattered on the table. After finishing the meal and clearing the table, Jackson invited the boys to join him. They gathered around the crackling fire. Guys, Jackson began, his voice full of sincerity. I want to have a serious conversation with you, man to man. I have strong feelings for your mother, and I would like to start a romantic relationship with her. But before anything happens, it is extremely important for me to get your approval. I sincerely care about each of you, and your opinion means a lot to me. So, can I get your blessing for a date with your mom? The three boys exchanged glances, their faces showing surprise at being asked such a question. There was silence in the air as they considered the weight of Jackson's words. The two younger brothers looked at the older brother and nodded in agreement. The eldest son turned his attention to Jackson. Of course, sir, we will be very grateful to you. Jackson got up from his seat, and the boys followed suit, hugging tightly. Jackson heard the younger brother's question, wanting reassurance. Will you be our new father? In response, he hugged them even tighter. His heart was touched. If that is your wish, I will honorably accept it. Watching this heartfelt scene, Rebecca couldn't help but cry with joy. Rebecca knew that her boys needed a positive male influence in their lives as much as she did. They needed someone who could be a role model while they were growing up. Wiping her tears with a napkin, she watched her youngest son excitedly grab a basketball from the closet and rush to the basketball court. At this time, Jackson and his brothers were looking forward to when they would be able to take part in a regular doubles game. As Rebecca was putting everything in order, throwing away a garbage bag filled with leftovers, her thoughts were interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. While playing basketball, he didn't notice her presence. With tears streaming down her face, she wiped them off with a kitchen towel and walked through the patio doors into the house. When she reached the front door, the bell rang again, and when she opened it, she saw that Dee was standing there. Startled, Rebecca lost her balance and staggered back, but Dee forcefully pushed her inside. What do you think you're doing in my house? Dee growled. Stealing herself, Rebecca stood up and pushed Dean back a step. This is not your home anymore. It belongs to Jackson now. You live in an apartment on Richard Street. Do you remember how you asked me to leave last night? Dee looked at her friend for Jackson. Where is my husband? I spent the whole night in jail and he needed to bail me out. Rebecca hurried to stop Dee's progress coming face to face with her. Why do you think he should have gotten you out of prison? He is my husband, and it is his duty. Actually... It's not his responsibility to get you out of the drunk tank. It's very good that you were arrested for drinking alcoholic beverages in a public place. Watch your actions and choices. Bex felt a surge of anger towards her old friend. Dee hurried from one room to another, and Rebecca followed her relentlessly. Bex met Dee with determination in her eyes, expressing her understanding of the purpose of Dee's presence. But Bex firmly said that her attempts to maintain their mutual friendship were useless. Placing her hands on her hips, Bex met Dee's gaze, realizing that Dee was now in the same position as she was three years ago. As a married woman, you made several regrettable decisions that, unfortunately, led to the loss of your husband. As a result, you will now have to face the harsh reality of loneliness and its consequences. Every evening I returned to an empty and quiet apartment, where there was no longer the warmth and affection of a loving husband. Although I am grateful for our children, it is important to recognize that your son has grown up and your husband is seeking a divorce. Undoubtedly, it will be a difficult path. Imagine a future in which, at the age of 45, you find yourself alone in the cozy atmosphere of your home on weekday evenings, and looking forward to the onset of Friday and Saturday evenings. It is at these moments that you hope to meet a man, any man who can fill the void in your bed and ease your loneliness. Dee stared at Bex, mesmerized by her words. Rebecca continued by offering her wisdom on dating issues. In my experience, you can meet men with amazing qualities, 
but I am sad to say that many of them are so narcissistic that they are not able to truly nourish and satisfy the needs of a woman, leaving only physical intimacy as their only contribution. They often face difficulties in their profession or problems at work due to the constant desire to seduce other women. First of all, they are focused on maintaining their personal statistics. Although you may seem attractive and able to attract a lot of men for intimate meetings, these people visit bars solely to find a companion or get involved with any free woman. It is unlikely that in such an environment you will find a potential husband. I didn't want this to happen, but this morning I got into a physical relationship with Jackson. She raised her hand to emphasize her statement. With great attention and zeal, she couldn't help but smile at herself. This is really rare, Dee exclaimed, regret in her voice. What a fool I am. You're absolutely right. He's extraordinary, the best lover I've ever had. And I foolishly didn't notice it. It seemed to me that I would go on an adventure that he would never know about, hoping to experience something even better. This kind of passion happens once in a lifetime. But now I realize that I've already had it. Dee whispered, her voice breaking. Bex headed for the patio door. Jackson's out with the boys, and I can go get him if you want. Dee stood next to her friend and watched Jackson effortlessly kick the ball into the basketball hoop. He really embodies a wonderful father figure. It slipped my mind how much joy I get watching his basketball prowess. Dee looked at her friend and asked, Do you feel love for him? Bex quickly replied, Yes, I am. But today, for the first time, we entered into a romantic relationship. I'm not sure if his feelings match mine, but if he chooses me, I am ready to devote my whole life to his happiness. Although we are both approaching menopause, a stage that will inevitably bring changes, I believe that Jackson is a compassionate person who will adjust and find solutions to maintain our relationship, she said with tears in her eyes. In fact, I came here today with the intention of resuming our intimacy, even if it means enduring discomfort. If he has entered into physical intimacy with you, it means the end of our relationship, and he will move on. I know his character well, and I believe that he will not allow such a situation. Given the opportunity, Dee headed for the door, where she paused for a moment and changed direction. With determination in her eyes, she announced her intention to find a lawyer and begin signing the necessary documents. Later, Rebecca informed Jackson about Dee's visit, mentioning that her lawyer was going to contact his lawyer. In response, Jackson gathered Rebecca and her sons together and escorted them home. He kissed her affectionately and gently closed the car door. Dee asked for a brief meeting with Jackson and his lawyer before their court appearance. Jackson understood that Diana was striving for some kind of completion. She expressed a desire for forgiveness, acknowledging her past selfishness and sensitivity. She admitted that she did not notice his incredible qualities and regretted spending time with other friends. She knew that he never wanted her to behave like this, and he made it clear to her. I had a strong feeling that your loyalty was wavering during the bachelorette parties, it seemed that there were always witnesses to your actions that you didn't know about. Over the years, I have received numerous photos and text messages from people who noticed you in various establishments, but I willingly turned a blind eye to all this because of my love for you. But I've reached my limit. When I returned home that Saturday and heard that you were planning to go after another man, I realized that our relationship had come to an end. If you don't need me anymore, then let him have you. With that, he left. Goodbye, Diana. You will always have a place in my heart. Despite our separation, we will continue to cross paths on special occasions and when it concerns our son. I promise to maintain a respectful and friendly attitude. In difficult times, I will be by your side, but we will never sleep in the same bed again. I have always been faithful to you, and I will never change my loyalty. When he closed the door, Diana couldn't hold back her tears. As time passed, Dee never met her prince. She came across men who only wanted intimacy from her. Even her perfect appearance did not attract a decent man because it was just a shell and rot inside. 
I have been thinking about one question for quite a long time. During my time in the highest echelons of power at the company, I received a solid six-figure salary for years of tireless effort and dedication. I have enjoyed the numerous awards that have accompanied my success. But there was one problem with my wife, Judy. Now, as we approach the 25th anniversary of our life together, I can't help but reflect on the evolution of our relationship. When our paths first crossed, Judy exuded a stunning beauty that thrilled me. Her figure was simply amazing. She possessed intelligence, vitality, unwavering support, boundless affection, and unyielding loyalty. In fact, Judy embodied all the qualities of an ideal wife. Alas, the past has flowed into the present, and circumstances have changed. After having two beautiful children and 25 years of happy marriage, she gained weight and seemed to have lost her spark. Her interests revolved around soap operas and reality shows topics that no longer bothered me. In every way, I've outgrown Judy. Attending corporate events and dining with her no longer attracted me. Instead, I dreamed of a wife who would be respected and admired by other leaders, not pitied. With my 50th birthday approaching, I felt an urgent need to prepare for the most profitable year and retirement. I needed a companion whom I could proudly accompany to dinners and various social events. Someone who understood the difficulties I faced in my business and could help me achieve my ambitious goals. Unfortunately, Judy seemed to be hindering my progress. Watching my senior management colleagues leave their first wives and marry younger and more attractive partners who better match their status and influence, I realized that it was time to make a difficult choice. The exact moment when this thought became fixed in my mind has not yet been determined. I have been thinking about my choice for almost a year, not daring to seem callous or selfish, abandoning my wife, the mother of our children, in pursuit of a young companion. I was looking for a justification for my actions, trying to present myself as a victim, not a heartless being. Numerous considerations prompted me to be careful. Judy turned out to be an exceptional mother to our children, and I was afraid to push them away. Besides, it seemed that my aging parents were more attached to Judy than to me. There have been serious disagreements in our marriage on several occasions. I had to give arguments and justify my decision to end the marriage, keeping the peace in the family. It was unpleasant for me to see my mother blindly supporting Judy, as if she had forgotten who her real child was. Both of my sisters were close friends of Judy's, and even Judy's brother, with whom we played golf together, always gave preference to his sister's well-being. These circumstances created various difficulties for me. But I came to realize that the only acceptable solution to end my marriage without further conflict in my family was to expose Judy's infidelity. By proving that she was cheating on me, I would strengthen my position and give strong arguments in favor of my decision. Such an approach would not only help me maintain harmony with my loved ones, but also give me the completion I need to move forward. Despite my suspicions, I knew that mom would most likely approve of Judy's decision to look for a real man. Once I made the decision to prove Judy's infidelity, it became very important that it happen. But it wasn't easy to do that. I always believed that she was faithful to me. I would rather bet on peace in Iraq than imagine Judy breaking her marital promises. Deep down, Judy was devoted and gentle. From the first days of our marriage, I couldn't help but notice how men admired her. She had an irresistible attraction for any man, except those who are blind. To protect my marriage ties, I took prompt measures, persuading Judy to embark on the path of parenthood and tirelessly provide for our family. Judy accepted her role as a wonderful mother with ease, and I had no difficulty convincing her to marry me. When our children grew up, I skillfully convinced her that their well-being required her undivided attention as a stay-at-home mother. Even while fulfilling her maternal duties, she remained a charming and very sought-after woman. The arrival of two children only enhanced her captivating attractiveness, highlighting her alluring curves. I was sure that if I let Judy find a job, she would constantly face unwanted advances from men. Now our children have grown up, 
my daughter has received an accountant's degree, and my son is on the verge of getting an engineering degree, and I was very proud of their successes. I believe that Judy's constant care and love played a significant role in their success. When our nest was empty and the kids went to college, Judy started to gain weight. She was getting bored, and she sought solace in visiting restaurants to pass the time. The growing habit of spending hours in front of the TV, accompanied by constant snacks, has become her new norm. Although she never expressed her concern, it became apparent that she had put on a lot of weight, possibly exceeding 40 pounds in just two years. Her breasts, buttocks, and thighs have noticeably increased in size. The weight gain seemed to affect her self-esteem, and she began to avoid visiting our pool due to an increased sense of shyness. Given her discomfort about her figure, I was thinking about how to arouse her interest in the novel. Besides, I wondered where she could meet people who would appreciate her for who she is. Away from the TV, a thought popped into my head. The same reasons that have kept Judy in our house all these years have now led me to believe that it's time for her to go out. Honey, I began, noticing Judy's recent bouts of boredom. I think you'll find more happiness if you find a job. Even a part-time job could give you the opportunity to get new experiences and dilute the monotony. A mischievous smile appeared on Judy's face, and she playfully remarked, Jason, you always seem to know what I'm thinking. I've been thinking about getting a job for some time now, but I can't find a suitable way to discuss it with you. You've always been against me working outside of our house and I was afraid that finding a job elsewhere would disappoint you. I wanted you to be available to our children whenever they needed you, Judy. But now that they have grown up and left the nest, we need to take into account your needs as well, I said calmly. How about we start exploring various websites and ads to understand what opportunities exist, I suggested. To my surprise, Jason, I have already taken this step. I came across several interesting options, but I don't want to put too much hope in them. But I'm sure I can find an option that will fit our busy plans. I don't want to take away the precious time we spend together, dear, Judy said. Inwardly, I praised myself for being able to present this idea so subtly. The most difficult thing was to be patient and bring your plan to completion. I was well aware that it could take a year or even more to implement it. I had a difficult path ahead of me but I knew that I had to remain steadfast and purposeful. Surprisingly, just three days later Judy broke the news to me during our dinner. I found a job that I really like, Judy exclaimed, deftly slicing a second chop. Oh, you mean the doggy style? I asked, perfectly understanding her sense of humor. Well, that's nothing new, unless you've experimented with the mailman, I added playfully. Judy's laughter stuck in her throat. Her face flushed as she tried to catch her breath among the pieces of mashed potatoes. Please, no jokes while I'm eating, she croaked, still giggling. It was actually a UPS courier, she continued, regaining her composure. And if he hadn't shown me how to do it, I wouldn't have believed it was even possible. The challenge is to keep the goat from getting to the whipped cream and pickles, at least until it's time to eat them. I thought about the decision for a moment, pretending to carefully calculate all possible scenarios while Judy looks at me. Although whipped cream is not exactly my cup of tea, you are well aware of my undeniable love for goats, I said with a grin. Unfortunately, I have to decline the offer of a well-meaning person from the delivery service. I praised Judy, calling her a good girl, and expressed sincere interest as it seemed to me that this might interest me. Judy smiled. Oh, I was hoping to discover something new. I think almost every husband in the area has done the carrot trick for the dog a couple of times, I replied. Jason, it's hard to look serious with you. I found a job. Judy laughed. I plan to enroll in a real estate course next week. Sam Gold of Sam Gold Real Estate has kindly agreed to sponsor me while I get a professional license in this field. Although it should have given me great joy, I couldn't help feeling anxious. Sam Gold, known for his success as a real estate broker and reputation as a ladies' man, was not a man to be taken lightly. 
Just the thought of his skill with women made me feel uncomfortable. I noticed your disapproving expression, Jason, when I mentioned his name. You don't have to worry about me. I'm able to take care of myself. Moreover, he is unlikely to be interested in someone like me. He seems to be attracted to anyone, even if it means hiding a snake under a rock. He won't hesitate to pursue you or any other woman who comes into his life. Judy abruptly stood up, rushed into the bedroom and forcefully closed the door. It dawned on me that I had made some serious mistakes. I couldn't help but agree with her self-assessment as unattractive, but I still protested her decision to work with Sam Galt. He was perfect for my plans, surpassing everyone else in the entire Poconos. But I realized that I needed to overcome my tendency to possessiveness and jealousy. Would this man dare to take my wife away from me? Or maybe he found her unattractive because of her weight. Who does he think he is, rejecting Judy's advances? The realization that I was slowly losing my mind led me to decide that it was time to change my strategy. When I entered the bedroom, I found Judy in tears, with her face buried in the pillow. I sat down on the bed and began gently massaging her shoulders. Judy, I sincerely regret my actions and admit my stupidity. Our time together was wonderful, and I foolishly let it spoil. I sincerely promise never to hint that your relationship with Sam Gold is not professional. I fully trust you, and I promise not to show any signs of jealousy in the future. But it pains me to hear that you agreed with the offensive statement that I'm fat. I'm just a middle-aged housewife struggling with her weight. Why am I trying to fool myself by making a career in sales? It is often said that people prefer not to get involved with unpleasant personalities. In my case, I have to find a more suitable option, akin to an elderly cow. If there is a problem, I suggest solving it constructively, rather than resorting to excessive lamentation and frustration. Perhaps we could consider signing up for Silver's Gym tomorrow to start a fitness journey together. It is quite possible that at the same time you will lose a few kilograms, while maintaining your attractive physique, which can potentially attract a significant male portion of customers. Would you be interested in accompanying me in this endeavor? Judy found solace in a pillow, expressing her emotions through tears. I realized that getting in shape is important in order to attract an interesting partner when I find myself alone again. Judy, on the other hand, needed to lose weight to increase her chances of finding someone who wanted to love her. It seemed like a win-win situation for both of us. I was pleasantly surprised by how much smarter I had become, and it even helped me become like a loving and attentive husband. Honey, I'd be happy to join you at the gym, I said. I promise you will witness the incredible transformation that we will achieve in a year, being in the best shape of our lives. The next day, I confidently entered the gym, completed the necessary paperwork, paid the required fees, and began my fitness journey. Judy, accepting her femininity, strongly recommended buying special workout clothes to improve our appearance while exercising and sweating. At first I was hesitant to agree, but then I realized that gyms open up a lot of opportunities for new acquaintances. Eventually there will be other men out there looking to lose weight. In addition, Judy's physical attractiveness remained unchanged, despite a few extra pounds. This could potentially work in my favor. While we were shopping, Judy also stated that she needed a professional wardrobe to complement her new career. I considered it premature to purchase an outfit for a job that required passing a state exam. The prospect seemed overwhelming, but I kept silent because I considered it my duty to be a loving, supportive husband to my wife in all respects. Financially, we were able to afford it. Moreover, if I could prove infidelity, the money saved during the divorce would exceed the cost of clothes. It took several days to purchase all the necessary accessories. Judy was of the opinion that we should maintain a stylish appearance even in difficult times. In addition, she has changed her approach to grocery shopping. I searched for a long time, but I couldn't find chips in the house. Our snack options were limited to cauliflower, granola bars, and other less interesting options. 
The variety of food has decreased significantly, and salads have become the main dishes. Although Judy did not deprive herself and me of food, she definitely tried to reduce the number of calories consumed. After finishing classes, we often met at the gym. It was during these sessions, especially on the treadmill, that Judy shared with me all the details of her day. I couldn't help but wonder how she managed to walk such long distances at a fast pace and still have no difficulty keeping up a conversation. Meanwhile, I was sweating profusely, barely keeping up with her and only nodding in agreement from time to time. Every morning I got out of bed feeling completely exhausted and exhausted. Doubts crept into my head. Is all the effort I put into this plan really worth it? But already in the second week, I began to notice small improvements in my energy level. Judy, my coach, took this opportunity to intensify our training by increasing the pace and angle of inclination. As we got used to these exercises, she gradually introduced additional weights, constantly monitoring my progress with unwavering attention. At first I felt annoyed by her relentless exertion, but over time it dawned on me that she was only making herself even more tense. Our gym sessions lasted about an hour and a half, during which Judy tirelessly devoted herself to work. In an unexpected turn of events, Judy began to learn French. She seemed to be seeking solace from the overwhelming task of studying real estate sales manuals by immersing herself in the world of the French language. Meanwhile, I have always believed that refreshing beer is the best way to relax. The fateful day arrived, marked by Judy's anxiety, who was preparing for the French exam. Deciding to strengthen her self-confidence, I devoted myself to helping her study, inadvertently acquiring a lot of knowledge about real estate sales in the process. When Judy started her exam, I waited patiently for her to return in the cozy living room. Eventually I dozed off and fell into a deep sleep. The various exercises we did definitely increased my stamina, but I found that when I let myself relax, I really let go. My nap was suddenly interrupted by Judy, who woke me up by shaking me vigorously by the shoulder. Hello, Sonia, she laughed. I passed the test. Perplexed, I asked. How do you know? Don't we have to wait for the results to arrive in the mail? Judy replied with a smug grin. Come on, Neanderthal. Leave the Stone Age behind. Computers are in fashion now. I was wrong about only one question. Sam will be thrilled to hear about my success. And the name came up again. This time I managed to hide a smile. Feeling Judy's gaze on me, I couldn't help but wonder why the UPS man hadn't entered into a close relationship with her, and not with this disgusting person. Surely these men knew the art of charming housewives. To tell you the truth, I was thinking about having an affair with a complete stranger myself, and not with this pathetic Sam Galt. And yet I couldn't understand why it mattered to me. This question has remained unanswered. I eventually convinced myself that Judy deserved to experience the thrill of getting lost for the first time. I was thinking of putting her through a stormy ordeal by revealing her secrets to our relatives and forcibly evicting her. I reluctantly admitted that my scheme was wrong. Over the course of several weeks, Judy suffered numerous setbacks in her real estate endeavors failing to achieve a single sale and not even getting close to it. I was terrified that she might give up, go home and go back to her old habit of indulging in sweets. In this scenario, the only glimmer of hope for me would be a UPS courier. Despite this, we persevered in going to the gym and eating salads. I began to notice noticeable changes in my appearance. My waist had shrunk to a size 34, and the shirts now fit me perfectly. Not only that, my stamina has improved significantly, and many women in my workplace have complimented my improved appearance. It dawned on me that when the moment came, I would be able to choose Judy's replacement. I quietly admired my reflection in the mirror many times during the day, reveling in my masculinity. Sam Gold has now approached the buyer to sign a contract for one of my properties. Judy was beaming with joy. I will receive $5,000, which may not be a very large amount, but it is a step in the right direction. Jason, I think I've been paying too much attention to direct sales. 
It seems that listing agents make money effortlessly. In the future, I intend to focus on placing real estate listings on the internet, she said. This is an amazing start, Judy, I exclaimed. Would you like to celebrate this achievement? Sam taught me to refrain from spending and celebrating until the check is in my possession. There may be many unforeseen circumstances before the sale is completed. Judy admitted that Sam was surprisingly attentive and supportive, and I understood the ulterior motive behind his actions. He had a hidden desire to pursue my wife, and at the moment he was creating a facade of professionalism and politeness as a prelude to his seductive courtship. A few months will pass, and he will move to the stage where he will expect my wife to return the courtship. To be honest, I thought he was a treacherous man. Fortunately, his participation was crucial to my overall plan, otherwise I would have resorted to extreme measures of retaliation. Staying true to her promise, Judy began listing various features of the surrounding area, such as sidewalks and bushes. She said there would be no shortage of opportunities for her in the real estate market. She managed to get a lot of offers, ranging from residential real estate to commercial properties and even agricultural land. While she was looking forward to completing her first deal, she was already finishing work on five other sales contracts, upon completion of which she would receive a significant sum of $42,000. Just a week before the completion of the first deal, she took another opportunity by signing a contract for a farm that she had put up for sale. The agreed price for this property was an impressive $845,000, and being both a sale and listing agent, she received generous commissions of more than $35,000. This remarkable success has only spurred her determination to maintain the momentum she has achieved and continue to thrive in the real estate industry. Judy assumed that in her first year of work, her earnings would effortlessly surpass mine. Jason, Sam kindly invited us to an event on Thursday to celebrate the successful completion of my first deal. Although this is my first closing party, it looks like there will be many such occasions in the future. Sam chose a restaurant called Powdered Sugar for this and invited the entire sales department there, including the secretaries and their spouses. The cost of this celebration will exceed the amount that I will receive from the sale, but Sam believes that I have proved my worth in all possible ways, Penny concluded. I'm sorry, I meant Judy. A rich man had the means to pamper himself by hiring additional people with dubious reputations. Through quick calculations, it became clear to me that Judy was hired by a man who had unjustly lost his wealth. I wanted one of the salesmen to take the initiative and establish a relationship with Judy before unpleasant Sam took advantage of her. That sounds great, honey, but I had a little difficulty. On Thursday evening, I have to go to Maryland to meet with colleagues early the next morning. I have to leave around 9 o'clock to have time to rest and prepare for an early meeting, I explained. You have shown me incredible kindness, and I am sincerely grateful to you for everything you have done. Your continued support and patience over the past few months have meant the world to me. If I complained that you had to leave, it would be the epitome of selfishness. I'm just relieved and grateful that you were able to do it. It feels like the universe has conspired in my favor granting my plans a divine blessing. Sam Snakehead Galt found me an easy target. He knew that Judy would betray me, and as a result, it would be me who would suffer. Surprisingly, the apparent implementation of my plan did not bring me the expected joy. On Thursday morning, I prepared my overnight bag before heading to work. Judy and I agreed to meet at a restaurant conveniently located on the way to Maryland. So, I could have extended my stay here if I hadn't had to take her home and then return to Maryland. By avoiding this extra trip, I would have saved over an hour of travel time. I arrived at the restaurant before Judy, which made me head to the bar for a drink. While waiting patiently for her arrival, I struck up a conversation with some of the suppliers Judy worked with. They all congratulated me on having such a wonderful and capable wife. Even Sam Gold shook my hand and took 10 whole minutes to highlight the amazing qualities that Judy possesses. Although he didn't say anything inappropriate, I couldn't help but feel his hidden thoughts as a man. 
Eventually Judy entered the hall. I looked away when she entered the room, but the unusual silence caught my attention. Curiosity made me turn around, and what I saw completely amazed me. Judy was wearing a stunning black dress that accentuated her figure. It was incredibly short, exposing her stunning cleavage and showing off her fantastic legs. Lost in my own vanity, looking at my reflection in the mirror, I did not notice Judy's transformation. Her waist seemed incredibly thin, as if she really embodied the essence of an hourglass. My breath caught in my throat as she gracefully glided over to me and kissed me in a way that left me speechless. In the blink of an eye, she became the center of attention, and deservedly so. She easily charmed everyone present at the party with her laughter, smiles, jokes, and fascinating conversations. She completely controlled the atmosphere. Several young women who had attracted attention before were now barely noticeable in Judy's presence. So that Judy wouldn't worry about my upcoming trip, I tried to limit my alcohol consumption. Staying sober, I watched the swarm of impatient people surrounding Judith, fighting for her attention. It was quite obvious that many men had set their sights on seducing her, but Sam Gold, an imposing figure, made it clear in no uncertain terms that he had arrived before anyone else. It's amazing how obvious these signs become if you know what to pay attention to. I had a strong feeling that Sam not only knew it was time for me to leave, but was also eager to get me out the door as soon as possible. Well, my dear, it's time for me to hit the road. You look amazing today, and I'm immensely proud of you, my love, I said to Judy, kissing her on the cheek. Don't stay up late and please be careful. Thank you very much, Jason. I will definitely take care of myself. Don't worry. By the way, that makes me think, Jason. The brakes of my car suddenly started making a grinding sound, and today I left it at Ollie's car service station. I guess you shouldn't worry about that, dear, I interrupted. You can get a replacement, any color you like, and personalize it as you see fit. We'll meet tomorrow night. As I was about to leave, I noticed Sam Gold walking up to Judy and striking up a conversation with her. He wasted no time in seducing her. After waiting a couple of hours, I decided to return home with a plan to catch him red-handed in our bed. To capture this event for a long time, I recently purchased a new digital camera equipped with a powerful flash. The goal was not only to preserve evidence for my family, Judy's family, and the trial, but also to capture the truth unfolding before my eyes. I went on a short trip to a nearby small bar located about five miles from our house, where I patiently settled down. It was very important to give Sam enough time to get into Judy's bed, or rather, into our bed. While enjoying the taste of beer, I reflected on how well everything turned out, given the circumstances. It was an otherworldly experience. I had no difficulty guiding Judy through my intricate scheme, and she readily followed me. As I expected, she quickly found a very profitable job. It was amazing to see how far she had come from her previous state. She willingly joined me in the gym, without needing any persuasion. Who would have guessed that in a few months, this once overweight woman would show up at a party looking like a stunning supermodel? Perhaps she would have been better off without my influence. Thinking about further actions, I tried to determine my next strategic move. In a few months, I will be a divorced and accomplished person, radiating confidence and attractiveness. Getting back on the dating scene shouldn't be too difficult, right? I just had to be careful not to be deceived by someone who was only interested in my wealth. Fortunately, I had already found an honest, intelligent, and sincere partner, so I knew that it was possible to do it again. Judy would certainly have no problems in this regard. She had financial stability and independence. In addition, she had already lost most of the excess weight gained over the years and looked simply stunning. I noticed a slight decrease in the size of her breasts, although it was not significant considering the weight she had lost. At the party, she was completely at ease, participated in conversations and sincerely enjoyed jokes and remarks. Judy had a unique ability to make anyone feel important, so I felt it necessary to keep a close eye on her all these years. If I hadn't done that, 
then most likely she would have been taken away from me long ago. Leaving her at home was undoubtedly the right decision. It was obvious that her newfound slimness and preoccupation had played a role in her confident demeanor. While men were constantly trying to seduce her, I couldn't help but worry about how to protect my new young wife. I didn't want to create a new family just to keep her at home. Given her responsibilities at the gym, at work, and at various social events, it became obvious that I would have to be vigilant and watch her every move. Thoughts came to mind that she had a high libido, and I would not be able to satisfy her. But I found comfort in the fact that Judy always enjoyed our intimate moments together. It seemed to me that for her the priority was not only sex. She found purpose in her family and our relationship. She never wanted to hurt me or anyone she cared about. Therefore, intimacy with Judy has always been filled with tenderness and caution. She wanted to experience love and be loved, not participate in mindless meetings. Unfortunately, Sam, stupidly ignorant, could not understand this. Judy behaved gracefully and deserved to be treated accordingly. Just the thought of Judy being with Sam or anyone else made me feel disgusted and anxious. Her mood, humor, love of family and character were things that other men could not comprehend and truly appreciate. She was a complete and decent person, so why was I trying to arrange an affair for her? It suddenly dawned on me that the problem was not with Judy, but with myself. As I grew up, I felt an emptiness in my life, but I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was. I mistakenly thought that Judy was bothering me in some way, but what exactly was bothering me? What was it about being a loving and devoted mother and wife that hindered my personal growth? It seemed to me that my bright youth was slipping away, leaving behind a feeling of longing. Strangely, a relationship with a younger woman reminded me that I was getting older rather than rejuvenating me. Will anyone else be able to take care of me the way Judy does? The answer to this question was painfully clear. How did I let myself get to this state? Deciding not to be late, I hurriedly headed for the exit. The trip home was accompanied by a whirlwind of thoughts that overwhelmed my still-developing mind. Time seemed to drag on endlessly. If I had returned home and found Sam in our bed, my first reaction would not have been to use violence or throw Judy aside. Despite her actions, deep down I knew that I would never choose to harm Sam because of the risk of losing Judy. At that moment, I realized that I needed her more than ever before, surpassing any previous addiction. Instead, I would calmly tell Sam to leave and humbly apologize to Judy, admitting my own stupidity. As I reflected on the irony of the situation, a grim smile appeared on my lips. I was ready to confront my wife for infidelity and at the same time ask her for forgiveness. I desperately hoped that she had no emotional connection with this despicable man and that their affair was purely physical, as cheating spouses often claim. I would have been delighted to hear that, and readily agreed. But the thing was, Judy wasn't the type to enter into a purely physical relationship. I was sure of it. Driving down the street, I noticed an unfamiliar car parked in our driveway, right in front of my garage door. There was a lump in my throat when I parked the car next to him. The front door was locked, so I carefully unlocked it and headed for the bedroom. That's when I heard it a murmur coming from the master bedroom. It was a clear sign that I had made a serious mistake. For a moment, I thought of running away, hoping to avoid the consequences of my actions. But I quickly realized that running away would only make the problem worse, not help me find a solution. Gathering my courage, I went to the door and noticed that a thin ray of light was seeping through the crack. Cautiously, I turned the door handle not knowing what was waiting for me on the other side. Taking a deep breath, I gathered my strength to push open the door and enter the room. To my surprise, Judy's voice pierced the air, caught off guard by my sudden presence. I looked around, but there wasn't a soul around. I couldn't figure out where the voices were coming from. It was only later that I noticed that she had put on the headphones she usually puts on when diving into her French cassettes. She was completely absorbed in learning the language, and alone. Disoriented and alarmed, 
Judy met my gaze, demanding an explanation for my unexpected presence. Her words were trembling with fear, and her hands were visibly shaking in confirmation. My sudden appearance startled her to the depths of her soul, evoking images of a murderer or a possessive husband. Jason, she asked, did you expect to find someone else here? It's payback time. What did I want to say? Sometimes a little untruth is preferable to the truth. Marriage instilled this lesson in me, although it usually concerned mundane matters such as housework or cleaning the basement. Was there any way to get out of the predicament that I had created or was trying to create for myself? Then my gaze fell on a prominent carrot next to Judy, and it dawned on me that I would be given free entry to our house. It was obvious that she was not expecting guests that evening. All that remains is to find that elusive Doberman. I noticed a carrot, and I'm wondering if UPS is delivering so late or were you waiting for someone else? Whose car is parked in the driveway? Judy blushed with the intensity he had never seen before. I'm just... I mean... I was going to... I've never done this before. Judy blushed again. I really missed you. I... Well... I felt incredibly lonely. As a result, I rented a car from Ollie as the brakes on mine are in terrible condition. Judy, you looked absolutely amazing tonight and that's why I couldn't bring myself to go to Maryland. I asked Jack to cover for me at the meeting and I hurried to you. Gasping for breath, I exclaimed, You are the most wonderful wife a man can count on. Tears welled up in my eyes. Jason, you've been incredibly supportive of me. You motivated me to find a job, helped me prepare for the exam, bought me a variety of clothes and helped me lose pounds, Judy said with a smile. I am sincerely grateful to you and I love you immensely. Moreover, I believe that my love for you has become even stronger, and that says a lot. Can I kindly move these stubborn carrots from their intended place and replace them with something more attractive? I asked. I would be very grateful, my dear. Just don't forget to add more honey and hurry up. The courier can arrive at any moment. My beloved wife grinned.